tonight on CBC Vancouver News. 70 days is so past anything reasonable. Broken elevator frustration builds for vulnerable residents forced to climb six flights of stairs to get home. Also, cutting down trees is not a popular thing in this province now. 6,000 jobs, 25 sawmills. Why are so many shutting down? And how does a bear get into somebody's car and lock the door? Bear on board, stuck inside an SUV in Fort Moody. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. A broken elevator is taking its toll on people living in a building on Vancouver's downtown east side. It's been months since the elevator actually worked inside the SRO Hilden Hotel, leaving residents frustrated. And as our John Hernandez reports, the building is owned by a prominent Vancouver businesswoman. It's a daily grind that leaves Gary Ratzinger gasping for air. The disabled 65-year-old goes up and down six flights of stairs every day, and it's starting to take a toll. Pulled a muscle in my back, not too painful, but that led to a pinched nerve. The elevator inside the Hilden Hotel is broken. Ratzinger says it's been out of order for at least two and a half months. But 70 days is so past anything reasonable. Some residents here can't even remember the last time it worked. You know, I'm literally carrying some of the elderly residents downstairs that need to get out and carrying them back up. And that's like six flights of stairs. The elevator is the latest in a long list of problems, one that includes cockroaches, bed bugs, and dilapidated bathrooms. It's unfortunate because it's turning into a typical uh, SRO, downtown SRO. The Hilden Hotel is more than 100 years old. It's owned by Vancouver businesswoman Jackie Cohen, owner of Army and Navy, and a swath of other properties in the neighborhood. She didn't respond to a request for interview, but in a statement said it's up to the building operator to maintain and fully address any issues that impact his tenants. That building operator is Gus Greer, who also runs the Bourbon Pub downstairs. I'm just a tenant. Uh, I'm just a leasee. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to live on the margins. At the end of the day, it, it is not my building. So well, if, if I can't make it work, something's going to have to be done. And it won't be by me if I can't make it work. Greer says he wants to sell his lease for the building, but that won't solve any of the lingering issues here anytime soon. The stressors just keep piling up and piling up and piling up. Residents like Ratzinger want to send the owner and management a message. Spend a little cash. Come over more often. We are human. You know, you use the old line, we are human beings, but it's true. What would your message be to the owner, management? Uh, get your sh together. <laughs> Basically, that's about it, and uh, pay your bills. Cohen said that despite it not being her problem, she's ready to take it on herself. But city officials confirm the hotel operator, Greer, has already ordered the elevator repaired. A city inspection of the entire building has been scheduled for later this month. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Job losses are mounting as sawmills close across the province. The latest one in Kelowna. An estimated 6,000 workers are now affected. And as the CBC's Tina Lovegreen reports, workers are wondering what the province is doing to help. All of this will be shut down eventually. This has been the stomping grounds for Leif Lynam for the past 22 years. You could say this is all he knows. At 58 years old, I'll have to start looking for something new to do. Teal Jones announced earlier this week it's putting an end to its logging operations, meaning layoffs for 300 loggers and uncertainty for another 500 mill employees like Lynam. A lot of the people that work here are, uh, are late in their careers and they wonder what they're going to do uh, to get through to retirement now. For the past few months, BC has been plagued by a series of mill curtailments and closures, affecting nearly 6,000 workers at 25 mills across 22 communities. So what's behind all of this? According to the companies, it is low lumber prices, high operating costs and dwindling timber supplies. Wood fiber shortage in BC is due partly because of wildfires and a severe mountain pine needle infestation. But the opposition critic says there are policies the government can bring in to save a struggling industry. 60% of the problem is stumpage, and that's a big one that can be done. The other 40% is government policy, whether it's 
an overabundance of regulations and pain that has to go through in terms of trying to get permits and through the process, or it's things like the employer health tax or the carbon tax or other steps that make our industry less competitive. The provincial government says it is taking action and is providing supports like job fairs and skills training to those affected, as well as looking for ways to diversify as fibre supply declines. But mill workers don't feel like they're getting much support. It feels like they're working on the other team. As they count down the days, hoping for a different outcome. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Surrey. Another veteran local politician is trying to block ride-hailing companies from operating in her city. Delta City Councillor Lois Jackson is joining Surrey's mayor in the fight against operators like Uber and Lyft. Municipal Affairs reporter Justin McElroy joins us now with more. Justin, what is Jackson's plan to stop this? Uh, Jackson, former longtime mayor of Delta, hoping essentially that all municipalities in BC rise up and tell the province that they don't want ride hailing going in unless municipalities lead the way in terms of how it's happening. So she's put forward to council a motion asking for an emergency resolution at the UBCM conference later this month, as well as asking the passenger transportation board to halt what they're doing until they can talk with cities, basically arguing that it should be elected councils across the lower mainland and not an appointed board by the provincial government making this big decision. Let's do it right for all the, uh, how many, four million people in the lower mainland and not be just uh, stating, well, we have to have this in by the end of the year. Um, I, I think there are uh, so many questions now that I see arising from places like Los Angeles, New York, Seattle, and other places that are learning a lot about how this is unfolding. I'm not saying it's all bad. I'm saying I think we should take a sober second look. So there you go. That vote will take place on Monday night. Uh, Jackson says she doesn't know whether it will pass, but she thinks that with all that's happened over the past few months, it's worth it to give a shot trying to stop it. Okay, Justin, the big question here, can municipalities actually block companies like Uber and Lyft? Well, and this is the thing we heard from McCallum earlier this week saying that he would uh, revoke business licenses or not issue business licenses. But when you look at the letter of the law that the provincial government has put out there, there's not a heck of a lot of tools available for cities, whether they like or dislike ride hailing. Take a look right there at the provincial government's website where they say municipal authority on these new laws. They say the passenger transportation board is in charge. Municipalities can't stop vehicles like this from operating in their municipality and any bylaws that they have in place are void as of later this week so they can try and stop this but even in delta where jackson is talking it's not looking likely that it's going to even pass council the mayor has spoken out against it and a fellow councillor dylan kruger also says he thinks it's only a matter of time until ride hailing is there this motion shouldn't be coming anywhere near a council table. First of all, this is not in our jurisdiction as a municipal government. This is a provincial issue. But I'll be opposing this motion uh, on behalf of every single Metro Vancouver resident who has ever been passed up on a taxi ride because they wanted to go too far or they didn't have any cash or they had to wait 30 minutes for a cab ride. We desperately need ride sharing in Vancouver and that's no more real than here in Delta uh, where we already have existing transportation challenges. You know, it's likely we might hear more of this some from some municipal leaders in the next few weeks, but they have very little tools here. It's probably a question of when, not if, bride hailing comes for Metro Vancouver. Justin McElroy, thank you. One person was taken to hospital with a back injury after a car crashed into a truck near the Georgia Viaduct. Happened at Gorin Pryor just after midnight. A black Land Rover was stopped at a red light when it was hit from behind by a gray Mazda 3. There were four people in the Land Rover and two people in the Mazda at the time of the crash. Police say speed and alcohol are factors. The 22-year-old driver of the Mazda facing charges for impaired driving and refusing to provide a breath sample. A West End masseur has been charged with sex assault and police believe there could be more alleged victims. A 31-year-old woman was allegedly assaulted at the Toe to Soul Relax Lounge on West Broadway last month. Police say an employee may have used their position to assault the woman who was a customer. 61-year-old Amado Ramos was arrested and charged a few days ago but is now free on bail. Police believe there may be more victims who haven't reported anything and police are working to identify them.
The emergency room at Abbotsford Regional Hospital is getting a $16 million expansion. D.C.'s health minister admits the facility has been plagued by overcrowding since opening in 2008. The 825-square-meter uh, upgrade will include new trauma bays and 12 new patient exam rooms. The ER has been known to house patients in hallways for long periods of time, leading to questions about whether some deaths could have been prevented. The emergency room will stay open during renovations, which are expected to be completed by the summer of 2021. Well, workers at the Hyatt Regency in downtown Vancouver picketed today, asking the public to withdraw business from the hotel. The employees say they are officially boycotting the Hyatt, saying the hotel isn't providing sustainable working conditions. Some of the things they are asking for include full-time hours, better wages, improved benefits and safety standards. The Unite Here Local 40 union members want to bargain for a fair contract after being without one for 14 months. It's a heavier workload, the demands and the expectation a lot higher, and at the end of the day, our body aches. Although they aren't officially on strike yet, workers from the Hyatt, Pinnacle, Harborfront, uh, Hotel Georgia and the West Inn have issued strike notice. Well, a victory for TD Canada Trust customer Preston Buffalo. Last night we told you what happened when someone stole his checkbook. That person wrote $100 checks and ended up stealing $600 from Buffalo's bank account. The bank initially said it would not reimburse the money because it was his responsibility to protect his checkbook. After the CBC News story, TD Canada Trust says it has decided to refund the money. Now, if you have any stories you'd like us to check out, please send an email to investigate at cbc.ca. Brett Sauter home. Brett Sauter home. We know <laughs> who he is. your name right one time. <laughs> Jordan, so, you're here. Yeah, you're I'm right here. joining us now for the first look at the weather. Yeah, and I mean, really, the best way to, I think, introduce this is the phrase, so it begins. Just in the past hour or so, we've seen some rain start to push into the metro region. It's been raining fairly steadily over toward the Sunshine Coast in Nanaimo, but is now making its way on shore. And as I look outside of our studio at this moment, you can see lots of umbrellas with people making their way on the sidewalk. So the question is, is this going to be continuing? The answer is yes. In terms of temperature, right now all of that rain is making it a little cooler though we are not too far away from seasonal but 17 degrees is definitely a far cry from where we were a few weeks ago but here's your weekend planner we've made it congratulations hopefully you can take into account this weather to kind of mitigate whatever's going to be going on for the remainder of the overnight period a few showers are expected to continue lows are going to go down to about 14 degrees or so Saturday morning though this is going to be an interesting one we're going to probably see a few spotty showers to start off the morning and that is going to change over into some heavier rain throughout the evening hours. So for the evening Saturday and into Sunday, that's probably where we're going to be seeing the heaviest rain. Highs are going to only go up to about 17 and then come Sunday, we're not looking at nearly heavy rain, but I would mention that we are probably going to be seeing some scattered showers off and on and it definitely is going to be a little bit on the cooler side. Daytime highs only getting up to about 16 and then come the evening hours, we may be getting really close to about 10 degrees. So nice and cozy perhaps? Uh, yeah, something like that. We'll go with that. <laughs> Thanks Brett. You're welcome. Okay, an unusual break and enter, to say the least, in Port Moody. It happened this morning and was caught on camera. How does a bear get into somebody's car and lock the door? Yeah, good question. Police believe it used its paws to gain entry. They were called when the black bear was spotted inside the SUV. Police and conservation officers opened the door and the bear went on its way. The inside of the SUV was badly damaged by the would-be thief. Just another reminder for residents to lock your car doors and garbage containers. Pretty scary. They can get in. They can get in. Well, we've seen that before, opening car doors. It's, yeah. It happens every year. <laughs> okay, you can watch this newscast and all of CBC's other award-winning content wherever you go by downloading the free CBC Gem app. CBC Vancouver also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. You can follow us on all platforms for extra content you won't see on TV. A potential breach is rocking Canada's intelligence community and now a high-ranking RCMP employee is facing charges under a rarely used law. More on that next. Well, happy Friday to you if you're tuning in to us on CBC Gem, Facebook or YouTube. We are here during our regularly scheduled three-minute commercial break. 
Spin classes, that's what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. They're popular in, in fitness, a big trend right now. And if you don't know what they are, there are classes where groups of people gather on stationary bikes and exercise together. Yes, one elementary school is taking the idea a little more literally and has put stationary bikes in their classrooms. They found it not only helps the kids burn off some steam, it also helps them focus on their lessons. Have a look. In Mrs. Peter's grade four class, there's one seat all kids want. They can take all your energy out and when you feel sad or lonely, this can help you a lot. South Oaks Elementary School has nine stationary bikes like this. One is for adults and the rest are for kids. Classes in grades one through four can take a spin anytime. I've seen the bike, especially in winter, is so beneficial to just have us have a place to move around and get some of, some of our pent up energy out. <laughs> it's getting too easy. Longtime teacher Alvira Peters uses the bikes to help her eight and nine year olds pay attention. Whether they're down and need to be alert or more commonly when they're struggling to sit still. I just see them coming off of it, um, feeling refreshed and heading back to their jobs. Um, uh, at the end of the year they'll just be working there, they'll be doing all their work on the bike, they'll be reading there. So I just feel like it's, it's a real holistic kind of approach. South Oaks principal Dale Martins pays for the bikes with a grant from the Hanover School Division. They cost about $700 each and are designed especially for classrooms. The bikes are virtually silent and small enough for a six-year-old. Martins wants to eventually have bikes in all his classrooms. It also really helps the teachers actually because I just had a grade one teacher who was here last year, had a bike, and this year we didn't have a bike for her. She's in a different room and she says to me, I'm, I miss that bike. Mrs. Peter's grade four students continue to ride. She hopes the bike encourages active habits early so kids work out all year long and beyond. It's a good idea. It is a good idea. There's a school uh, on Vancouver Island that does that, Saanich. Oh, good. Okay. Let's the kids blow off a little steam. Why not? Get some exercise in. All those things, all good. Um, stay with us. We're going to be back in just a couple of seconds with the latest on Olympian Kaylee Humphreys and her departure from Team Canada. senior employee working with the RCMP is in custody tonight, charged with stealing some of this country's secrets. Now, Canadian intelligence and government officials taking stock of the damage. Salima Shivji outlines what we know so far. An arrest that's shaken not only the RCMP, but the entire intelligence community to its core. A senior civilian with the forces intelligence team in custody, charged under Canada's rarely used Security of Information Act. The allegations are that he uh, obtained, uh, stored, processed uh, sensitive information, we believe with the intent to communicate it to people that he shouldn't be communicating it to. Cameron Ortis, an expert in East Asian affairs, computers and cybersecurity, is facing allegations dating back to February 2015. Accused of communicating sensitive information and gathering more this past year with the intent of selling it to a foreign government. Ortiz had access to enough secrets to be bound to secrecy for life. Classified intelligence from Canadian law enforcement and security services, but also allied information. So see, he had some of the broadest access that you get in the RCMP. So for me, it really comes down to what he took and what he was intending to do with it. A nightmare scenario. His arrest, sources say, set federal departments scrambling to assess the possible damage, even forcing a comment on the campaign trail. I can assure you that the authorities are taking this extremely seriously, uh, but you might understand, uh, I have no comment to make. Charges under this act are rare. In 2012, a former Navy intelligence officer pleaded guilty to selling secrets to Russia. 
Another case of a Canadian man accused of trying to spy for China is still in the courts after nearly six years because, experts say, of a delicate balancing act. This is a case about official secrets, basically, and the leakage of official secrets. And, and so the government has a, an, an interest, of course, in being able to prosecute successfully, but at the same time they have to balance that against not wanting to divulge information in public, in a in public trial, which has, this has to be. The CBC's Salima Shivji reporting tonight from Ottawa. Well, one of Canada's most decorated athletes says she wants to leave the country to compete for the United States. Bobsledder Kaylee Humphreys alleges she was harassed and she points the finger at the head coach of Bobsleigh Canada. As the CBC's Simon Dingley tells us, she's now launched a legal attack. Kaylee Humphreys is the face of Canadian Bobsleigh. It's Kaylee Humphreys with the gold medal by a tenth. Back-to-back -back gold medals and a bronze for Canada at three Olympics. Kaylee Humphreys and Heather Moyes defend the gold medal in women's bobsleigh for Canada. But Humphreys no longer wants to wave Canada's flag. She plans to start training with Team USA next week. It's really hard. It's hard. Um, this has been... This has been my life. Humphreys alleges Bobsleigh Canada breached the code of conduct between athletes and coaches. She points the finger at head coach Todd Hayes. She filed a harassment claim 13 months ago and says she's tired of waiting for a resolution. Humphreys is suing Bobsleigh Canada for blocking her release from the team. In a statement, she says, I cannot return to a work environment that I do not believe is safe. I am not choosing to leave Canada. I love this country. She's been very strong uh, vocally in the anti-bullying campaign, uh, spoke about uh, being bullied uh, early in her career. Um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, she believes that uh, she is in the right in this situation. Former Olympic synchronized swimmer Erin Wilson is studying emotional abuse amongst Olympic athletes. She says more than 60% of Canadian athletes report suffering emotional abuse. It's a lot of the coaches belittling athletes, um, you know, maybe comments about the body. Um, a lot of degrading comments are often seen within the sport. The U.S. team says it will welcome Humphreys. Humphreys says she has given the Canadian team until next Wednesday to release her. Bobsleigh Canada and Hayes won't comment on Humphreys' allegations, but Bobsleigh Canada says the investigation continues. A statement of defense has yet to be filed. Simon Dingley, CBC News, Toronto. An award-winning American actor is going to jail and paying a fine for her part in a college admissions scandal. Felicity Huffman admitted paying money to falsify her daughter's academic record. As we hear from the CBC's Zulaka Natu, today's sentence has raised questions about justice in the U.S. legal system. Excuse us, folks. Felicity Huffman was sentenced to two weeks in jail in that Boston courtroom. She's also received a year of supervised release. She was given a $30,000 fine and 250 hours of community service. In May, she pleaded guilty to one count of conspiracy and fraud and admitted to paying someone to get a proctor to change the answers for her daughter's SAT exam. She is the first parent to be sentenced in what has become the largest college admission scandal in U.S. history. And the sentence really sets the tone for the other cases that will be coming up in the near future. Keep in mind, there are still lots of parents facing charges, coaches, administrators. Uh, many of them have pleaded guilty. Others are still uh, hoping to fight those charges. This case, though, Huffman's case has also brought to light uh, how other women have been treated in the past in the U.S. when they faced uh, similar crimes. For example, Tanya McDowell, a homeless woman in Connecticut, was sentenced to five years in prison after illegally enrolling her five-year-old in a school in kindergarten that was out of district. In this case, the woman was black. She was of lower socioeconomic status. Prosecutors say that they wanted Huffman to receive jail time to deter wealthy parents in the future from considering bribes of their own. Zule Kanathu, CBC News, Los Angeles. Well, just days into the federal election campaign, candidates' old social media posts are coming back to haunt them. How party leaders are handling the situation next.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I'm literally carrying some of the elderly residents downstairs that need to get out and carrying them back up. And that's like six flights of stairs. Frustration is building for residents of an SRO who say the building's elevator has been broken for months. The building is owned by prominent Vancouver businesswoman Jackie Cohen, who owns Army and Navy. In a statement, Cohen says she's committed to making sure the problem is rectified as soon as possible. I've done this my whole life and, and the forest industry as a whole is shrinking and the idea that I'll be able to go find a job in another sawmill or this industry is probably unlikely. Sawmill job losses are mounting with the closure of yet another BC mill. The Tolco Mill near Kelowna is shutting down, putting almost 130 people out of work. Approximately 6,000 workers, 25 mills in 22 communities have been affected by closures, layoffs or shift reductions. How does this even happen? How does a bear get into somebody's car and lock the door? A fair question. Police were called when someone discovered this black bear in an SUV. It couldn't get out, so conservation officers were called in to help free it and send it on its way. While more than half of Canadians want the next federal government to continue on and finish the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, according to a new poll. The Angus Reid online survey found 53% of Canadians want the project to go ahead, while 24 want it stopped. Despite the support for the project, over 60% see renewable energy as a huge opportunity for Canada. Four in ten believe the government should be doing more to increase the pipeline capacity, while a third believe it's pushing the project too much. More than 1,500 people participated in the survey conducted in August. Whether it's incentives for small businesses, tax breaks, or the ability of Canadian families to save more of it, money is at the core of the messages from the three top political leaders today. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer began the day at a transit stop in Mississauga, Ontario. He says he'll bring back the public transit tax credit that was scrapped by the Liberals if he becomes Prime Minister. Later, Scheer held another event in Toronto where he repeated his promise to get rid of the GST from the price of heating your home. For his part, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh was also talking dollars and cents in Toronto. He started the day promising to put a price cap on cell phone and internet services. Later, he delivered a speech at Toronto's Canadian Club, promising to raise taxes on corporations and wealthy Canadians. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau began the day in Trois-Rivières, Quebec. He's promising grants of up to $50,000 for up to 2,000 entrepreneurs each per year to build startups. Trudeau is holding another rally in Montreal this evening. Well, the election campaign is just days old, and already it's becoming very clear how important it is for parties to vet their candidates because their opponents are bound to find whatever old online posts they miss. And as Katie Simpson shows us, that threw some leaders off message again today. Andrew Scheer stood by his candidate running in a key Ontario riding, even though Arpan Kahana had to apologize today for a homophobic social media post he published back in 2010. Thank you very much. He's also defending this candidate after sharing an Islamophobic tweet from 2013. Two local candidates that you mentioned here have apologized for their messages and, uh, and I accept their apology. I'm glad that they have done that. Sheer was less forgiving of a third candidate running in Manitoba, firing him for Islamophobic comments he made online. While this is not what Sheer wants to talk about, by no means is this just a conservative problem. I find that unacceptable, and as I said, his, his position within the party is being re-vetted. The Greens were caught off guard by an anti-abortion comment from one candidate and fired another for posting about sending a pig carcass to Muslims. The Liberals booted a Quebec imam over online comments he made on Israel. And this NDP candidate was dropped after flippant and aggressive words aimed at oil workers were discovered online. There's no excuse for this to happen. Some of these incidents were unearthed by other political parties. I mean, clearly, if your opponent can find stupid things that your candidate said, you should be able to find them too. 
Some voters, though, seem willing to look past older posts. People do change. Um, they might have said some things that uh, in the past that maybe they have uh, regret because their views have changed. I think it would depend on when they made the comment and how they feel about whatever it is they said now. Sometimes, you know, these things could get spun out um, of context. Partisan research teams spend months digging up dirt on their opponents, waiting for the perfect time to strike. This will only become more intense as Election Day gets closer. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Brampton, Ontario. At 6.33, a live look at Camby Street in Vancouver. The weekend is here, but so is the rain. So will it be a complete washout? Well, Brett will tell us next. They are the kind of treks that draw tourists from all around the world. Maybe it's the West Coast Trail, the Juan de Fuca Trail, or even the grueling North Coast Trail. But as the CBC's Adam Vanderswan introduces us to a group of hikers who don't exactly fit the mold of outdoor enthusiasts. Backpacking trip on the Juan de Fuca is up and down and up and down. You'd think these formerly homeless men would be tired of the outdoors. But this hike through Vancouver Island's coastal forest is different. These people are friends and they're on a journey of personal growth and discovery. I've been homeless more than one time in my life. And sleeping outdoors can, can be fun if you're in, a, in a, a good environment, but when you don't have any safety to return to, it can be sort of frightening and, um, and demoralizing, uh, especially if you're you know, really unsure about how you got there. Ali, whose full name the CBC has agreed to withhold, says his time living rough led him to Anoim House, a support home for those who live in poverty. There, he was invited to be part of a set of group outdoor activities, ending in a four-day hike through the Juan de Fuca Marine Trail. It would change his perspectives on sleeping outdoors. We got to cook great meals together. We got to sit and drink tea together and share stories together. Ken Wiley runs the Mountains for Growth program. For years, he's worked as a guide in the Rocky Mountains. He says being out in nature is a powerful tool for learning about yourself. Connection to self is time alone in nature where we you know just have time to ponder and and be with the environment ourselves 
um, and being with others. Wiley started the program after an eye-opening walk through downtown Victoria, where he was struck by how many people were living on the street. I thought, wow, you know, there's, there's, there's something that I need to do here, but I'm not exactly sure what. Wiley soon connected with Anawim House to bring outdoor activities to those transitioning back to a healthy life. Last year was the first time a small group of men embarked on their journey, shared stories with each other, and learned they've got what it takes to overcome a challenge. Terry Edison Brown is the director of Anawim House. He's just returned from this year's hiking trip in Strathcona Park and says this program is invaluable for those in need. I work very closely with our guys and I heard things that I have never heard. And the whole feeling of trust, companionship, fellowship. For Ali, he says being outdoors among friends he trusts really changed his view of himself. He learned he could be a good listener and help those who need a shoulder. I think anything that challenges us to get outside of our comfort zone and um, and be together with other people and um, get active and uh, trust others is, uh, is good for personal growth. I'm looking forward to camping again. Adam Vanderswan, CBC News, Victoria. Absolutely West will air a full documentary on the unique hiking club. Mm -hmm. You can watch The Weight We Carry tomorrow, 7 o'clock in the evening right here on CBC television. And it's also available starting today on GEM, which is our streaming platform. Oh, Brett is here. I feel like I'm not a very popular guy. You and your <laughs> weekend rain. Uh, no. I don't think you'll be popular for a while. No, I think We're I need to go into hiding at this point in time. <laughs> yeah, there's rain coming. I mean, again, I try to be that guy that says we need it and all that, but uh, I feel for those, like those hikers, if you needed to get outside and do some mm -hmm. hiking in this, it might be a bit more challenging, but, but not I, impossible. I really like it. Cozy okay. up in a blanket, Good. have the fireplace on, light a candle. Now that's it. You know how it goes. Same. That's yeah. amazing. All right, let's take a look at how this morning played out here over the North Shore Mountains. I mean, I presume presume there are mountains. You wouldn't really be able to see them in this particular case. Really fast moving clouds coming in. That would be remnants of the front that swept through last night, bringing us some spotty showers today. And what you're looking at now, I think in sped up time, that may very well be what we're going to be expecting throughout this upcoming weekend. I wanted to walk you through why it's not going to be a complete washout of a weekend, but there will be more rain than anything else. Saturday morning, as it comes through, we're going to start with a few spotty showers across the region. It's not going to be heavy. They are going to be quite localized. But come the evening hours, really, specifically around 8 o'clock, this is where things are going to start to ramp up. We're going to see some of that heavier rainfall, but predominantly, and fortunately in some cases, this is just going to be in the overnight period, Saturday into Sunday, where the heaviest rain is going to be falling, especially over the North Shore Mountains there. And then throughout Sunday, it is going to be gradually easing. So we are expecting a few spotty showers, but it is not going to be a complete washout of a day. And then by the time that we get into Monday, we might even see that sun return. Wouldn't that be nice? In terms of rainfall totals here, I want you to keep in mind this is for the entire weekend. So you're going to see some colors on here that maybe we haven't seen for a little while. Specifically for Metro Van, I would ballpark us at a comfortable 20 to 40 millimeters of rain for the entire weekend. Of course, places up to say Coquitlam, Maple Ridge, you're at a slightly higher elevation. That means you're probably going to get a little bit more. And then down into the valley as well, we'd be looking at a comfortable 40 or so. Now, in terms of that, there is, of course, another aspect that is always important to mention here, we do have some strong winds coming, and especially even for Vancouver and right around Tawasson, we're looking at some strong southerly winds coming that could be potentially 50 kilometers an hour by Saturday evening. So do keep that in mind, especially if you have any sailings to be worrying about. And of course, temperatures all across the southern half of the province are going to be on the cool side. Now, in terms of your five-day forecast, huh? as I said, maybe a little bit of sun come Monday, and then guess what? Just in time for Tuesday and Wednesday, yet another system bringing us more rain. Isn't that fun? It's a lot of fun, Brett. Can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. In Victoria, the Vancouver Canucks training camp started today. A chance for fans who don't normally get to see their favorite NHL stars during the season to watch them up close. The likes of Bo Horvat, Elias Pettersson, and Quinn Hughes are all there. But there is one Canucks star who is notably absent. Jamie Strachan explains why a similar scene is playing out across the league. You don't want to think about going into the season with uh, without Mitch on the roster on opening night. 
For Toronto Maple Leafs general manager Kyle Dubas, it's the unavoidable training camp topic. Marner moving in, shoots, he scores! Mitch Marner is looking for a big payday. I would feel a little differently, I think personally, if there weren't other situations around the league that were that were sort of in the same stalemate of position. Pass over the wrist shot, scores! Marner shoots, scores! Here's Marner, scores! Dubas is right. A number of Canadian teams are currently locked in tense multi-million dollar contract talks. In Vancouver, it's Brock Besser. Winnipeg has a pair of stars unsigned, Patrick Laine and Kyle Connor. Players want a bigger piece of a pie that continues to grow. Consider this. In the last 12 years, NHL revenues have doubled. Recently, Seattle paid $860 million for an expansion franchise. Sedan all the way around, banks it off the boards to Weidman. At the same time, players see this growth continuing to ramp upwards and want short, lucrative contracts. When they get their free agent status, then they think they're going to, that's when they're going to hit pay dirt. And so they don't want to be locked in. There's a lot more money coming down the pipe. A new gambling deal means hundreds of millions and a rich new television deal is on the horizon. And if you're a star player in the NHL, it's a great time to be on the ice. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. And Marner did sign Yeah, they said there was a hint that the deal was on the horizon and he just signed a while ago. Mitch Marner, uh... 65.36 million? for six years. Well, it's a yeah. little bit of money. So that, the speculation is that'll now trigger the other uh, free agents to maybe sign. So we'll wait and see what happens with Brock Besser. All right. It became a symbol of the wrath of a hurricane. So why is a destroyed crane drawing a crowd in Halifax? We'll tell you why next. In the Maritimes tonight, the cleanup after Hurricane Dorian continues. Last weekend's storm toppled a massive construction crane like a toy, leaving the metal structure wrapped over a building. Now, as Colleen Jones explains, the symbol of devastation is drawing a crowd. It's crazy. With necks craned upwards and this crane facing downwards, 
Welcome to Halifax's new tourist attraction. Well, I heard it made the news all over the world. This New York couple came hoping to see the fall colors, not a falling crane. Is this not on your tourist attractions at Halifax? No, it's the not. No, you, crane? you need no. to update that. Brilliant, I just took some pictures of it. With a fear that it could snap, pictures were snapped. Totally fascinating indeed, yes. yes. I've not seen anything like this before. <laughs> That's crazy, man. Chris Clayton came down to see what everybody's talking about. Is this the latest spectator sport in Canada? Right in now Halifax? it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right now it is. Crane right. watching. Crane watching is usually something yeah, this like guy does online. Like Have you ever seen anything like this before? No, on YouTube. Go to YouTube, crane collapses. <laughs> it, there's a lot of really interesting. But to see it for real, yeah. that's another yeah. thing. So people are twisting and craning their necks to get a look at the very twisted crane. Yeah. Surprised how many people are down here taking pictures? It's unreal. I didn't expect that. Even the Harbor Hopper City Tour slowed down for this. This is one tourist attraction that will soon disappear. It's a little scary. They'll start the delicate process of getting the crane down, so rubberneck while you can. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Halifax. Well, some may say it's hard not to be intrigued about a movie <laughs> of a band of exotic dancers plotting to take on their Wall Street clients. Yes, uh, Jennifer Lopez leads a talented cast of Hustlers, which was inspired by a true story. Our Eli Glasner has his review. Hey, uh, these are my sisters. Hustlers is the movie you expect, but so much more. Based on a true story, we start with Constance Wu as Destiny, the new girl just looking for a way to support herself. I just want to take care of my grandma, maybe go shopping every once in a while. It's 2007, and this swanky New York City nightclub is stacked with wealthy stockbrokers looking to spend. The Power Pack cast also features Lizzo, Cardi B, and more, but everything stops when Jennifer Lopez swans in as Ramona. One night, Destiny and Ramona are having a heart-to-heart, -heart, starting with Ramona talking about her glory days. So where's the God in blood? Wow. <laughs> But Ramona is also a savvy operator and soon takes Destiny under her wing, teaching her how to work the pole and keep the customers spending. It's all going great until the financial crisis of 2008. Suddenly the clubs are empty and Ramona is looking to even the score. We gotta start thinking like these Wall Street guys. You see what they did to this country? They stole from everybody. Hardworking people lost everything. And not one of these douchebags went to jail. Not one. Is that fair? In a world where ethics are irrelevant, a scheme is born. Destiny and Ramona's crew of devastatingly beautiful women go out to bars looking for rich, gullible men to drug and run up their credit cards. And so a film that starts like the female Magic Mike edges closer to something like Goodfellas. CBC News caught up with Jennifer Lopez on the red carpet and she told us what makes this film special is even though the women are performing for men, they're always in control. It's important right now because it's an all-female starring cast, it's all-female producers, it's a female director, and that is something that we don't get to see every day in Hollywood. This is really, you know, like a little mini miracle in a sense, and uh, beyond that, the story itself takes a real look at men and women and how we're treated so differently in this society and looked at so differently for the things that we choose to do or have to do for survival. Director Lorene Scafaria is the woman calling the shots, and what she captures is the camaraderie backstage, especially from Jennifer Lopez, who is warm and protective until the crimes start catching up. Jennifer Lopez, Oscar nominee? Prepare yourself. It could happen. Four stars out of five. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Four stars? Did you say Oscar nominee? Yeah. Okay. That's well, a lot, when he said, uh, when he compared it to Goodfellas, then you kind of know where he was going. Yeah. So. Well, if he likes it a lot. Right, then you're going to watch it. Maybe. It looks good. There you go. All right. Saving songbirds. How a Vancouver group is taking action to help the vanishing creatures after the break.
They're the most studied and famous whale family in the world. What's pushing J-Pod to the brink? I'm Gloria Makarenko, host of the new CBC British Columbia original podcast, Killers. Is it too late to save them? Well, songbirds are on the decline worldwide, but a team of researchers and volunteers is working to protect and grow bird populations. In this Creator Network original, meet the bird lovers behind the Vancouver Avian Research Centre. My name is uh, Derek Matthews. I'm the chair of the Vancouver Avian Research Centre. The Vancouver Avian Research Centre is a registered Canadian charity and volunteer organisation dedicated to wild bird research, conservation and education. During banding sessions, wild birds are uh, misnetted. What happens is as birds are flying through the brush, they fly into the net and then they're basically um, restrained, as you can see, in this long pocket. It doesn't matter which side they, um, they fly in from. We then extract the bird and we pop them into these uh, soft cloth bags. When birds arrive back to the banding pagoda, uh, they arrive in the, uh, the bag. And the first thing, of course, uh, the bird is identified to species. It's then banded using a uniquely numbered um, aluminum band. Two, seven, six, one, eight, five, five, seven, eight. The band is then attached to the bird's tarsus, and the bird will wear that band for the rest of its life. So if the bird is recaptured by us or at another station or found dead and the band reported, we know part of the bird's life history. Year over year, uh, we re-trap about 25% of our birds. And that can obviously tell you a lot about habitat um, um, fidelity, site fidelity for these birds. Um, these swains and thrushes are long distance migrants. We've um, had one bird we've re-trapped 22 times and sometimes in the very same net so if you think about that, these birds are going to Central South America, coming all the way back, not just to the lower mainland or Port Coquitlam, or even to Colony Farm, but to very specific areas in, inside the park, which again is why it's so important to, uh, to safeguard habitat for these uh, returning breeding birds. The birds of the world are in serious trouble and common species are in decline uh, all around the globe. Uh, 1,469 species, that's one in eight of the world's birds, are threatened with extinction and those threats include uh, habitat loss and degradation, uh, climate change and light pollution. Uh, plastic pollution continues worldwide. The continuing and widespread use of uh, pesticides across the agricultural landscape has also had a devastating effect on our aerial insectivores. Barn swallows have declined by more than 80% in the last uh, two decades. Local and regional parks form um, critical oases for breeding of migratory birds and none more so than Colony Farm which comprises in part of extensive old field habitat which is unique in the lower mainland. Develop suitable habitat in your gardens, uh, even tiny pieces of, of uh, nature are important for birds crossing increasingly fragmented landscape. In addition to um, collecting data, uh, to, to safeguard habitat for birds. VARC provides uh, lots of public outreach and education to raise awareness of, of environmental issues as they relate to birds. And uh, we do that through visitor programs, uh, which now include uh, a schools program as well. And the purpose of all of these events is to uh, really raise the awareness of these envi environmental issues through hands-on interaction with, with wild birds. So we just encourage people to come down, get involved, and you know, just experience you know, migratory birds in the hand and just really understand what a marvel it is that these birds are undertaking these tremendously long migratory journeys. People can make a difference and, and that's really what we're trying to do at VARG. Hey, you like that? You're a bit of a birder. Every time we have a bird story, I just love it. Yeah. Just, I can look at them for hours. And that's a neat, and uh, great project. It really is. Yeah. Really is. Uh, well, the weekend is here. Uh, that's it for us. Uh, just a reminder, you can always find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. And, of course, Dan Burrett is here after the National at 11 o'clock. Have a wonderful weekend. See you Monday.